I've been asked to speak about Joseph Smith's awareness of Greek and Latin. We've long been aware of the fact that Joseph Smith was interested in and had studied Hebrew and some Egyptian. But I've been surprised at the explicit evidence that exists for his use of Greek and Latin, especially Greek. Now, there are reasons why Greek and Joseph's rudimentary understandings of it have been missed by us in the past. But humbly, a modest case can be made that he had genuine interests in, gave actual support to, and achieved certain abilities in dealing with Greek, especially in the New Testament, and that he promoted certain insights and intuitions regarding the essentials of the working of ancient Greek texts. As Richard Bushman said yesterday, a golden age of classical learning had prevailed in America from 1760 to 1790, just a generation before Joseph Smith. By the early 19th century, however, opposition to the classics had become very outspoken in popular education and in society. By then, even lawyers, imagine that, were not required to study Latin. And so the teaching of Greek really survived minimally and mostly in institutions of higher learning dedicated to the preparation of students for the ministry where a high proficiency in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew was required, at least in the East. Overall, according to Samuel Miller, the first four decades of the national period saw a marked deterioration in classical studies in America. And by the beginning of Andrew Jackson's presidency, classical learning ceased to be a dynamic force in American public life. West of the Appalachians, it was even more so, where religious publications such as uh, the Campbellite newspapers made a big point of saying that their Western ministers, who did not know Greek or Latin, were every bit as competent as those trained ministers who were coming from the East. From this, one can conclude that it was by no means a given in Joseph Smith's world that showing off a knowledge of Greek and Latin would impress all people positively. Indeed, sentiments about training in the classics were deeply divided in America, even in the founding period of the Republic. Some people, such as John Adams, James Madison, James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, were fully in favor of the classics. Chief Justice Marshall had gone out of his way to be trained in a few years of Latin study in order so that he could matriculate at William and Mary College. But other members of the founding generation completely rejected the study of the classics. These included Benjamin Franklin, who of course was only in favor of something that was practical. Thomas Paine, the revolutionary who was only interested in new things, thought it best to abolish the study of dead Latin and Greek. And to epitomize this dichotomy, the erudite Thomas Jefferson personally enjoyed reading the classics and mined them for political purposes but still wanted to have languages other than Latin and Greek taught in the schools. Well, in this regard, I think we can distinguish between classical Greek and biblical Greek in Joseph Smith's life. While it's true that Joseph would join those who disparaged the value of reading Homer, Hesiod, Plato, Cicero, and others, he did not reject the importance of Greek for the study of the Bible. Indeed, in this way, he reflected perfectly these divided sentiments in his own world. Now, it must be also said that very few people around Joseph Smith knew much Greek or Latin. We've heard about Hiram, who knew a little bit of Hebrew, uh, but uh, even at Dartmouth probably never studied under the great uh, scholar there, who was one of the best classicists in the country. Sidney Rigdon, you would think, might have known some as a Campbellite minister, but I find no evidence that he did. Lorenzo Snow wanted to study Latin, went to Oberlin, but then instead changed his dream and went on a mission. According to Tom Alexander's biography, Wilford Woodruff finished common school in four years and studied classical languages and would then later study Latin at the Kirtland School after his return from Tennessee in 1837. Still, very few people knew much more than a smattering of Latin and probably even less Greek. Now, regarding Latin, 
Joseph Smith rarely used Latin except in legal and political contexts. And since these were really not ancient texts, his Latin is only tangentially related to the focus of this conference on Joseph and antiquity. But he had lots of occasions to learn Latin. I was asked to give you a list of the Latin phrases that we find in the Joseph Smith legal papers. And here you see only a partial list of the words that show up in these legal documents that Joseph didn't write and maybe never read, but at least was affected by in the many cases that he was involved with in New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. I won't bore you with a, a reading of these, uh, but there, there is no reason to believe that Joseph Smith saw these as containing some kind of esoteric language. They're just technical legal terms that the initiated into the legal profession might know. And still today, you must know that we use words like respondeat superior, res judicata, habeas corpus, res ipsa loquitur, and so on. And why? Well, and this is a joke, lawyers get paid by the word. And like in Scrabble, some words are worth more than others. <laughs> well, Joseph once boasted, I am a lawyer. I am a big lawyer. Well, he spent time studying the law. He certainly must have encountered legal words in the books he was reading. But more than that, Joseph used Latin in his own language on some occasion, broken down into these three periods. Occasionally in the 1830s, he would use ordinary phrases like sine de, meaning scheduling something without another appointment, pro tempore, for the time being, and so on. But then, on just a couple occasions in 1842, he uses two Latin phrases, in propria persona and summum bonum, in the revelation that became section 128 about baptism for the dead. And he would use summum bonum again in the Wentworth letter. Now, something has changed, uh, and I think what changed, as you look down this list, following those two little uh, uses in 1842, we have a, a gushing forth of Latin phrases, and in a lot of contexts, uh, O gladius, O crumina, where does he get this stuff? Ecce veritas, ecce cadaveros. Behold the truth, behold the mummies or the cadavers. Well, this was fairly common speech in, uh, in these days. Uh, in Joseph's political platform, there was a lot of this, and we don't know whether it comes from W.W. W. Phelps or other people. I think it's circulating fairly widely. Even in that views of, of government, we have the use of a Greek phrase. As the Greek might say, hysteron proteron, the cart before the horse. I have more to say about that another time, but that means doing things in the reverse order. And since it's a term that sometimes gets used for chiasmus, I couldn't pass up mentioning it. But Latin was used uh, by a lot of people around Joseph Smith, especially beginning uh, in the time that he was encountering uh, political problems in Missouri and in Illinois. And so Daniel Dunklin, governor of Missouri, writes, Vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Well, Joseph Smith will turn that around in his, uh, in his uh, views of government when he uh, when he speaks out, vox reprobi, ro vox diabolo, <laughs> voice of a reprobate, ro voice of the devil. <laughs> but uh, look at this in the 1840s. It's uh, actually John C. Bennett who comes in with lots of fancy Latin. And maybe that's influencing Joseph's uh, language in this direction. Particularly, it was John C. Bennett who was very fond of the motto of the city of Nauvoo. Uh, which was, as God was with our fathers, so may he be with us. In typical John C. Bennett fashion, he had pilfered this from the city of Boston, where it had been their motto. Well, Latin was used in political contexts for sport, for uh, putting people in their place, more or less. When Andrew Jackson went back to Harvard once, to uh, visit his alma mater, 
John Quincy Adams addressed the, uh, well, the whole congregation there in the chapel and gave a lengthy ad address in flawless Latin, knowing that Andrew Jackson's Latin was pretty rusty. Well, well not wanting to be embarrassed, Jackson responded with an incantation of nonsensical Latin phrases to the mortification and delight of many. Well, his strategy would be imitated by many people before social assemblies, and I think this explains and contextualizes the use of similar kinds of rhetorical outbursts that so flourished in Joseph Smith's political rhetoric as well. Well, aside from these Latin phrases, uh, did Joseph actually promote uh, the study of Latin or Greek? Uh, we have uh, in 1836 to 37, uh, the hiring of a person we haven't heard much about before, H.M. Hawes, Esquire, professor of Greek and Latin who came to teach at the school in Kirtland. Uh, we don't know how many actually took his classes out of the 135 to 140 total students, but uh, they had a classics department, and uh, only Greek, Latin, and I suppose Hebrew was also included in that. Joseph must have supported that. In 1835, uh, we have an account, I don't know if this is right or not, Elder Cowley, and this is a late recollection, says that Professor Satius conducted a class in Greek. It's possible, but we haven't uh, learned of that. Uh, but Joseph supposedly acquired some proficiency in language uh, Hebrew, yes, maybe Greek as well. And these classes were held in the uh, attic uh, after the temple was dedicated, and we've seen pictures of good space that was given, and all of us in academia know that space matters. Uh, these rooms had good light and heat. Heat, after all, rises. And uh, so I think Joseph did support and encourage this kind of thing. John C. Bennett gives us uh, the following probably grossly inflated opinion of the teaching of Greek in Nauvoo, claiming that before long this institution will be equal to, if not superior to, any college in this country, uh, and claiming that sciences, all of them are taught, including Latin, Greek, and so on. Uh, but we don't have any idea how many people actually uh, enrolled in those uh, schools. Another person, John Hatch, uh, began advertising in the Nauvoo neighbor that he would offer Latin and Greek in his select school. His ads ran for several months, but we, again, don't have any idea how many people took him up on that. But back to Kirtland. Uh, we have some interesting things going on in Joseph Smith's life regarding exposure to especially Greek uh, in beginning in January of 1834, when he acquired a copy of this book, which is owned by the uh, Community of Christ. It is an 1825 edition of the very eloquent and erudite Introduction to the Critical Study and Knowledge of the Holy Scriptures by Thomas Horn. Uh, he, on the, the inner uh, page, has written Joseph Smith, Jr., Kirtland, Ohio, January 1834, and gives the name of the person that he'd acquired the book from. I've examined this book and find no sign that it was ever opened, used, at least not annotated in any way. But if he had opened it and perused its pages, he would have found there uh, illustrations of things like Greek manuscripts, unsealed scripts, uh, and some pretty fancy ones. Uh, and also parallel columns uh, where you have Hebrew and then the Greek Septuagint in the middle and then the New Testament parallels to quotations from the Old Testament showing that, uh, you know, if you know some Hebrew, you can find your way around in the Greek. And Joseph enjoyed looking to see where words had been added or deleted in this, uh, in this whole process. So he's seeing these things. He has a copy in his own library. Well, did he actually ever study these things? And what tools might he have? In uh, 
November 1835, Oliver Cowdery brought back from New York a Greek lexicon and other books for Joseph, including Webster's 1828 American Dictionary of the English Language. Interestingly, that dictionary has lots of etymologies and cognates for English words in many languages as it gives the definitions for lots of these words. Uh, what might that lexicon have been that Oliver Cowdery brought? We don't know. But here's one that was published in Boston in 1826. There were such dictionaries, lexicon, lexicons available. Most of them, however, like this one, 1817, published in London. Another one here in 1820, again in London, and so on. Ty tri Tyros, also 1825 in London. So, but Joseph did have a lexicon, and as we'll see in Nauvoo, he made use of it. How much did he actually spend uh, time studying Greek? We have one entry in 1835, December 23rd. Instead of getting ready for Christmas, Joseph chose the higher path and spent the forenoon studying Greek. And although this is a later recollection, we have an account that in 1838, Joseph and the brethren had to wait to catch a ship in Richmond on the Missouri River and they had to spend 13 days there. And at that time, it says Joseph was studying Greek and Latin. When he got tired, which probably was all the time studying Greek and Latin, he would go and play with the children and uh, then go back to his studies. The most famous and next encounter with Greek comes with the, uh, uh, the visit of uh, Reverend Caswell, Caswell or Caswall, we think it's always pronounced Caswell. April 19th, 1842, he and Joseph Smith meet. Um, in the uh, published accounts of Caswell, he explained that he came to Nauvoo, uh, probably planning to lay a trap. He claimed to have an ancient Greek manuscript of the Psalter, the Book of Psalms, written upon parchment, and probably, he said, about 600 years old. Here are a couple 600-year-old Greek manuscripts. Well, we don't know exactly what happened in this encounter, partly because Caswell published four different versions of his story, and Nibley has had a heyday pointing out all of the inconsistencies and improbabilities there. Uh, I looked at Richard Bushman's Rough Stone Rolling to find out what really happened there, and Richard doesn't mention this event at all. I assume that means he takes it to not have any historical value. But he mentioned it yesterday, so now I'm in doubt on that. But Caswell simply said at the end that after this was all over, um, Joseph disappeared. I guess that was showing what a great magician he was. Actually, we know from his journal that he rode out in the city and examined some land near the north limits and spent the next day working on land developments in Nauvoo. This was a busy time for Joseph. He doesn't even mention in his journal that uh, Caswell was there. But there was a, a problem because Caswell thought that Joseph couldn't read any Greek. But you know, I got thinking, if this was a 12th century Greek manuscript, the Greek would have been Byzantine. And Byzantine script doesn't look like any other Greek you've ever seen, certainly not like the Greek that he would have encountered in Horn's commentary. This is in St. Catherine's Monastery. Uh, here's another one. Notice it's in two columns, which was typical for these parchment manuscripts. And Joseph does point out, well, it looks like a dictionary because it's in two columns. So this may be something like what he was looking at. But here's a, a 12th century Greek minuscule text uh, that I've worked with. And again, hard to read. Lots of classicists have to learn how to decipher these hands because they are very different. And how about that one? This is also Byzantine Greek. So if Joseph couldn't, on the spur of the moment, read this or even recognize what it was and was maybe even confused, gee, it doesn't look like Greek, maybe there's even some reformed Egyptian in it, he said. Well, it kind of looks that way, doesn't it? Well, here's the hieratic, which, uh, you know, if you want to see, sure, these scripts just look 
faintly like each other. Okay, uh, from all of this, and I won't go through a lot of the details, uh, we do know that uh, uh, Caswell's account has been confirmed. It was, to, at least to some extent, in the Times and Seasons. People don't realize that that was published uh, a year and a half later. Uh, but the story in the Times and Seasons is quite different than Caswell's story. But the bottom line here is that it doesn't prove anything about whether Joseph knew any biblical Greek or not. And so let me just turn finally to the places where, and we have about a dozen of these explicit accounts of where Joseph mentions the use of Greek, or at least he's engaged with this. In September 1842, we have an editorial in the Times and Seasons talking about the difference between the word baptism and the word to uh, sprinkle. Baptizo, and Joseph went to his dictionary, and there he could find that the word baptizo indeed means to, uh, to immerse, submerge, plunge, or sink. Now, this wouldn't have been nor unusual. Lots of people, probably Baptists, were making this argument as well. But Joseph was interested in it, not because he finds the meaning of it here in the dictionary, but because it's consistent with things that he has been teaching for 14 years. We have another account uh, in uh, September of 1842, uh, where, uh, well, this is in the Revelation on Baptism for the Dead. Uh, he offers what he calls a different view of the translation of Matthew 16, 19. Instead of whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, he, uh, he says whatsoever you shall record on earth shall be recorded in heaven. And he doesn't claim to get this from uh, the Greek or the Latin, but in fact, as, as with English, you have an ambiguity. You can make something binding if it's a contract, if it's put in writing. And that may be some of what's going on there. Uh, third, we have a, an unusual account of the defense of the definition of the word Mormon. And uh, Mormonism Unveiled had accused this of being pilfered from Greek. And indeed, Mormon uh, is a word that means hobgoblin or bugabear. But, uh, you know, having been attacked with classicism, Joseph doesn't respond with classicism, even though he could have, because in another lexicon, the word mormos, neuter would be mormon, means terrific, terrible, and that's usually describing a warrior being terrible and fearsome to his opponents. Well, not a bad name for the chief uh, leader of the Nephite army. But, hey, that's beside the point because Joseph goes on to talk about the meaning of the word Mormon, more moan, using the Egyptian good, more good. But notice that he gives not only the, those, but goes on to rattle off what uh, good is in Saxon, Danish, Gothic, German, Dutch, and so on. And where does he get this from? Right from his Webster's Dictionary, which gives the Saxon, Gothic, Greek, Danish, Swedish, and German Another. Now, he, it says here Greek, agathos, but he gives uh, kalos as a different Greek meaning. So maybe he knew that much Greek. Well, finally, we have an interesting development here, and that is that it's in 1843 and 44, Joseph regularly uses Greek as he is commenting on the New Testament in his Sunday sermons. He gives the correct translation of hell as a world of spirits. Uh, on another Sunday... He talks about Hebrews 7 and insists that the word Prince of Peace should be not the Prince of Salem. Now, he had learned about the spirit world from Revelation. He had learned about the meaning of the place, the name of Salem, as meaning not the King of Salem, but the King of Peace from Alma chapter 13. But now he finds that these things are consistent with what he has been teaching all along uh, on April 7th, 1844, he expounds at length the words of the Bible and says, if you do not believe me, you just don't believe the words of the learned man, emphasizing that James in Greek is always Jacob. And he saw some significance in that. And on May 12th, this is a Friday morning, uh, we have him using 
uh, the book of Revelation chapter 14, and the Greek and Hebrew supporting his meaning of uh, talking about the uh, restoration through the an another angel that would fly through the midst of heaven. So he's using his Bible and using these languages considerably. And he makes good use of these when he has the visit from John Quincy Adams. And although John Quincy Adams says, as a guest, we were not in a position and we were too polite to try to test his powers of examination to know how much Greek he actually used. Here, Joseph Smith makes a big distinction between the meaning of the word paradise as Jesus intended that word to be understood. This day shall you be with me in paradise, meaning not in heaven. There's another word for heaven. But being in paradise means the spirit world where departed spirits go. And he bases that on the original Greek and turns to John Quincy Adams and says, you, a learned person, will confirm my translation here. And John Quincy Adams respond, uh, records that uh, Joseph referred on this occasion to his miraculous gift of understanding all languages. Joseph sees this translation ability tied to confirming what he already knew as a miraculous part of his prophetic gift. He also showed John Quincy Adams and others a Bible that had Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and German of the New Testament. Hebrew of the New Testament. There were polyglot Bibles, and I'm showing you a picture of one of them here that uh, uh, was published in Nuremberg in 1599. I don't know if this was Joseph's, but it's a masterpiece of typesetting and perhaps uh, was the kind of thing that Joseph had and really loved. But as he said, I like the old book, but I like the Holy Ghost a lot more. Finally, uh, on his last sermon, June 16th, 1844, I want to read the text to you myself. This is a text from John 17. I am agreed with the Father, and the Father is agreed with me, and we are agreed as one. The Greek shows that it should be agreed. Well, the Greek word hen usually just means one as a numeral, but it can also mean united, the same, and can have a general sense like this. Apparently, Joseph seeing and knowing that the Father and the Son are one, but not in some kind of metaphysical, Trinitarian way, uses the Greek here to support what he has been teaching all along. Well, I think you see the uh, conclusions that I have. Let me end by just saying that this is a lot of the spirit of what is going on in 19th century biblical studies. An example of this is how people were translating 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. In the Greek, it reads familiarly, all scripture is inspired and is profitable. But other people were following some Latin manuscripts, reading it, all scripture that is inspired is profitable. Interestingly, the Joseph Smith translation had read, which he did back in March of 1832, and all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable. But even in the JST, how did he learn this kind of thing? And as it always was, he had already received a revelation in November of 1831 on the definition of scripture. And whatsoever they shall speak when moved upon by the Holy Ghost shall be scripture. And Joseph brings all of this together. Throughout Joseph's life, revelation came first. For Joseph, just like my small contribution to this conference today, all else, including insights from the Greek, were merely footnotes. Thank you.